thank you ladies and gentlemen for asking me here. This is my first trip to Muncie. I hope it won't be my last. Yeah. Is it bad? Like many educated or semi-educated Americans, I heard about Muncie many, many years ago. Yeah, yeah, I read uh, a <coughs> famous book on Middletown, or called Middletown, okay. which as you know, uh, analyzed Muncie as the quintessential example of mid-American, middle-western, middle-class American culture. And uh, we've gone through a phase in American culture, especially since World War II, in which it's been uh, increasingly fashionable to to denigrate this type of, of uh, I won't say mediocrity, but middleness, in which every community in the country has increasingly aspired to be in the mainstream, to be up to date, to belong to the national and international community. And without exception, this ambition has led to a general tendency to reject, to jettison, to throw away, to turn your back on uh, your own built environment, your own cultural traditions, your own uh, sources of physical and intellectual strength and to exchange these, because these are then considered as being uh, uh, parochial or provincial or in some fashion uh, no longer progressive. And instead of that, to remake everything, especially in the field of architecture, urbanism, uh, according to a set of cliches, really a very limited set of cliches, internationally circulated, <clears throat> as to what truly progressive architecture and truly progressive urban complexes and constructs should look like. <clears throat> and this tendency has reached a very extreme uh, limits probably more extreme in the USA than anywhere else on earth, largely because our technology, uh, we found ourselves in possession of the most uh, majestic technology on earth at the close of World War II, and uh, consequently the disastrous results of this kind of attitude are more clear in the USA than they are elsewhere. But the forces, the same forces, can be seen everywhere, in every city on Earth. And in every case, the root source of this disastrously mistaken decision has been, I think, on the part of, in our case, architects and urbanists, a perfectly well-intentioned even if mistaken, idea that <clears throat> uh, somewhere out yonder in Paris or London or Budapest or Tokyo, some place other than where you actually find yourself, there's a body of knowledge, there's a kind of culture, uh, there's a, a lifestyle that is <clears throat> authentically international. And the mark of progress, in fact, the requirement of progress, is to import this set of cliches, uh, to bring them into Muncie, if you have to live in Muncie, and to, as quickly as possible, brush under the rug uh, all evidences of, of previous Muncies. 
I think this policy has been disastrous, and it's a very complicated problem since I belong to the generation that advocated, that fought for the international style and uh, saw its victory, complete victory, in architectural and urbanistic circles. <clears throat> it's very difficult now to see exactly where we went wrong, because clearly we went wrong in a very serious fashion. And when I say that uh, I think it's high time for Munciites to return to Muncie uh, as a source of nourishment and inspiration, I don't want to seem anti-scientific or anti-cultural. <clears throat> Obviously, modern knowledge, modern science, modern technology has many aspects that are authentically international. Uh, gravity is a phenomenon that's international. It behaves in exactly the same fashion in uh, Ghana, Leningrad, and Muncie. Electricity is a phenomenon, a form of energy that is international in its behavior. And obviously anybody who intends to participate in the construction of the, of the physical environment has to learn how to master these forces and in that sense has to share with architects and engineers in Ghana and Leningrad and Lima and Muncie this body of knowledge. And our sense in this aspect then, our intuition that this was an authentically international, a validly international aspect of architecture, <coughs> was correct. But where we made the error, our error apparently, was in thinking that there were authentically international ways in which one handled electricity, or a unique set of, of uh, structural systems for resisting the force of gravity. And uh, <clears throat> this, it seems to me, is the source of our error. Reinforced concrete is obviously a majestic material. And if you want to work in reinforced concrete, you can study uh, a standard text, no matter what the language is. <clears throat> but how you use reinforced concrete, and in fact whether or not you should use reinforced concrete at all, is a force of a totally different color. Uh, you can say the same thing about all the major building materials. Glass, for example, is an extraordinary material, and thanks to modern science and technology, we have a, a range of glasses such as <coughs> nobody could have dreamt of 50 or 100 years ago. And the way this glass, these glasses behave in response to physical forces has to be studied internationally. But the way you use these glasses and whether or not you should use these glasses at all is a totally different problem. And if you move around the world today, <coughs> as I am lucky enough have been lucky enough to move, you really begin to have a, a hallucinatory sense that the architects of the entire world are completely out of touch with the world. They think they're practicing at an international, <clears throat> in an international fashion, but actually they're practicing in a fashion that isn't relevant anywhere. Uh, I've recently been to Lima, which is seven degrees south of the equator. And just before Christmas, I was in Leningrad, which is 62 degrees north of the equator. And architects in both of these cities are behaving in exactly the same fashion. And somebody's bound to be wrong. If a building works in Lima, it couldn't conceivably work well in Leningrad or vice versa. <clears throat> it's not merely that the architects in Lima 
keep one eye cocked on the architects in Leningrad to see what they're up to and vice versa, that would be bad enough. But what's even worse as a consequence of this policy is that native traditions, conventional wisdom, the whole resources of your own region are not only neglected, but they're thrown away. And the architects and urbanists then find themselves in the ludicrous position of cutting themselves off completely from their hinterland. Not, not only the physical hinterland, the farmland, for example, the woodlots and the pastures around Muncie, but the practices, the conventional wisdom, the know-how that people who've lived here in the Middle West have built up across two centuries. And these are resources of absolutely incalculable value, in my opinion. Not only in terms of forms, but in terms of knowledge and wisdom. And before these cultural resources are thrown away, they ought to be very carefully analyzed. I'll give you one example. I, was, I went to Lima <coughs> to participate in a session on the preservation of historic, the core, the historic core of Lima. And I knew nothing about Lima, uh, literally nothing about it. I was astonished to find it's a city of <coughs> three and a half million people, and uh, except for a stray palm or two, it looks exactly like Cleveland, Ohio, or Kansas City, and what little is left of a peculiar nature, the Peruvians are busily demolishing as quickly as they can. But in the core, in the center, is this great colonial town. And the Peruvians, with another side of their <clears throat> another, another side of the professional intelligence, obviously, knows that in this colonial core, they have a great resource, uh, not only artistically, but also from the standpoint of tourism, for example. So the question is, how can they intervene to preserve, consolidate, <coughs> explicate, modify, recycle this great colonial fabric. And so this is what the discussion is about. <coughs> so then you look at the fabric and you see it's all adobe. Although the town superficially looks as though it might have been built out of masonry with all the stuccoed walls and Baroque forms, luscious Baroque ornament. It turns out that this is all plaster, and it's plaster that's based on massive, the first floor all, of all Quito is in adobe, and the second floor, the only two floors in the entire city, old city, is of a very light, uh, <coughs> flexible wooden skeleton actually not even sawn timber, peeled, peeled poles with a, 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 a woven mesh, a cane, and this is stucco. Well, obviously, this is a brilliant response on the part of pre-industrial builders to the earthquake problem in Quito. Low structures, heavy mass, flexible top. So, <clears throat> Then, when you discuss, you see the nitty-gritty of preserving historic Quito, then the architects and engineers say, well, unfortunately, the problem is very complicated because we can no longer use adobe. Well, why can't you use adobe? Because of the earthquake. They had, they had a very serious earthquake there four years ago, and a number of buildings were destroyed. Some of them were, in fact, adobe. But <clears throat> then I said, well, Statistically, this shouldn't, couldn't be such a grave danger as you make it out because you have 9,200 old buildings in this quarter, many of them 400 years old. So statistically, adobe shouldn't be as dangerous as, as your engineers tell you it is. 
But it's too late, see? The engineers have decreed that from now on, all construction in Peru has got to be in concrete. Nobody's analyzing the possibilities of reinforcing mud masonry. See, mud is old-fashioned. Cement's not old-fashioned. Mud is. So the whole profession has locked itself out. There's this enormous resource uh, available to them. And by this kind of unilateral application of allegedly international technology, they've closed this door. And this, you know, has very bad consequences at every level for the future of Peruvian town planning aesthetically. First of all, for example, it means there are not going to be nearly as many schools built in the backwoods of Peru because concrete is a very expensive material down there. Steel is a very expensive material. Every peasant <clears throat> knows how to build very satisfactory buildings out of uh, adobe and could perfectly well build modern schools. These are all one-story schools. The climate is so genial, all you have to do is walk through the window. The, the very idea, you know, that these the building a school in this circumstance is a complicated issue, it really becomes hallucinatory. So the architects then are the prisoners, are imprisoned in a prison of their own making. And this is what one finds all over the world. I'm sure that the connection between the architects and engineers and urbanists in, and in, in Indianapolis, that they are just as remote from the people who live in the hills of southern Indiana as the architects in Cusco are from the peasants who live 25 miles outside the city. I'm sure that in New York City, with all our polish and refinement and international know-how, we're as isolated from the Catskills as uh, though they were in the Congo. And I think that this is a crisis of really uh, universal nature. It isn't just the American architectural profession that's caught in it. <clears throat> For example, uh, the Russians, uh, who incidentally are doing remarkable work in restoration and preservation of their historic structures, they're far ahead of us in that area, in terms of new construction, new town planning, are, are mimicking us. They, their architecture is the same kind of second-class competence as the average big American firm. But uh, they're using glass exactly the way we use glass in Tuckahoe and Phoenix and Miami. Nobody is asking. You see, glass is now available. They have thermopane, so everybody's using it. Now, the only real reason for using glass in Leningrad or in Miami is for transparency. You either you want a wall that is either transparent from the outside in, like a showcase in a department store, or transparent from the inside out, like a picture window in a country house. And for situations like that, glass is obviously indispensable. But <clears throat> if you're in Leningrad the day before Christmas, when the daylight is about four hours long, there's certainly nothing to see out. There's no call for transparency from the inside out. And there are many things, including temperatures of 10, 20 degrees below zero, that would suggest that uh, less transparent membranes, uh, membranes with higher heat capacity, would be the logical solution. Exactly the kind of membranes, of course, that Peter the Great dictated when he laid the city out. Masonry walls at 30 inches, three feet deep, relatively small windows, very compact plans, minimal, minimal exposed surface. I mean, you can admire Leningrad at, from many different levels, and one, but one of the most admirable levels is the way it responds as a super, as a megastructure to the climatic stress, the environmental stress of the climate. And uh, though <clears throat> it's to their credit, the Russians have architects who are specializing in uh, the restoration of the old fabric of Leningrad. They're a minority in the profession. 
And the profession is made up of hard-nosed hard hats that are just determined that everybody's got to live in 12-story skyscrapers just exactly like the urban renewal people here. And they all are glued into these tracks and, uh, and their errors are consequently compounding themselves. And I think that unless we can force ourselves uh, to face this kind of problem, that the whole profession, the design professions, are headed straight for disaster. I don't see any way uh, out of this cul-de-sac. The magazines now are full of a handful of very talented designers who are inventing all kinds of, improvising all kinds of startling new forms that are actually not even authentically new, but that's the way they're written up in the papers. Uh, the New York Five, for example, uh, is you know, being widely touted as representing some kind of authentissima guard. But these are purely formal manipulations. They're all nice men. I know most of them, and I admire them for their competence. But uh, I don't think they're seriously concerned. These are, are fundamentally frivolous activities. Uh, which don't really strike at all at the heart of the problem. And it seems to me it's in this context that the past offers us really untapped resources at every level, in, in the most concrete and uh, mundane terms. The biggest resource that Chicago architects and planners have is the tens, the hundreds of square miles of built urban tissue that's been thrown away like a Kleenex. It's not offshore oil. It's not nuclear energy. It's no mystery, mysterious new source of uh, resources that's going to save Chicago. If Chicago's can get around to facing the fact that they've got these enormous resources at their disposal, it should be re-examined, reinvestigated, retrieved, recycled. Uh, and of course, I'm not si singling Chicago out for any special program. This is true of every big American city. It's true of Kansas City, Cleveland, New York. And this suggests that the new field of activity <coughs> for the design professions is no longer the creation of isolated monuments that make handsome photographs, that stand in landscapes that have no context whatever, but rather to, to re-enter the real world and to break down this, this, these barricades that we have created around ourselves and understand that the only field of activity, the only real habitat for working architects and urbanists in Chicago is Chicago. It may well be that you can learn <clears throat> uh, some lessons by asking Fitch to come in and give a lecture or having a visiting critic from, from Paris. And undoubtedly, there's a certain uh, amount of, uh, of know-how that can be absorbed, picked up in this fashion. But the critical, the really critical task is to apply it to the actual experiential context in which you're trapped. Now, I don't know the extent to which <clears throat> people in this audience, especially the students in this audience, what they really know about the buildings that they've been taught to respect and admire. But I think you could safely say that every building, important American building, of the last 10 or 15, 20 years, almost without exception, that's been highly touted by the press, acclaimed, put into orbit, locked into place, becomes the paradigm for all future designers. Almost every one of these buildings is an authentic fact a disaster. And if you go back to visit the scene of the crime, of course, the designers never do this. Architects never go back to the scene of the crime. 
and the way scientists do. But <clears throat> if you want to know what the people who are trapped in Chicago Circle campus think about Chicago Circle, you ought to go there and talk to them. And you'll get a totally different verdict. But the, this international literature has, has uh, led you to believe. Well, one could multiply these examples endlessly. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'll bring this aspect of my sermon to a, a speedy close. But in every case, almost without exception, when you begin to realize the malfunction of these constructs, and then if you begin to look around and see what uh, previous generations did in the same context, you begin to sense that somehow or another there, there's all sorts of wisdom here that's been thrown away. I think that <clears throat> uh, for a modern architect to visit Jefferson's campus at uh, the University of Virginia could not, not be a, a humbling experience. It may be that you might even appreciate aesthetically. You may be uh, you know, sufficiently old-fashioned or sentimental to actually like uh, the way that uh, Jefferson's complex looks. But much more importantly, of course, is the way in which Jefferson used the resources of his time at the highest possible level and, and produced a college campus that measured against his resources is so much better than any college campus I know of today, it's not even funny. And the lesson we can learn from Jefferson is not that you have to burn, uh, to build out of brick and lime mortar, or that you have to use Corinthian columns. This is not the essence of it. The essence is that he responded to the most concrete, specific circumstances in a very rational and responsible fashion. My own involvement in historic preservation really comes from this. Uh, this is how I sort of say backed into it. I, I didn't begin with any antiquarian, uh, any especially antiquarian passion for old buildings. I really backed into it because it seemed to me increasingly wasteful, uh, the fashion in which we were handling these old buildings. And I think that this involves a certain uh, with me certainly, and I think with the rest of us who've gotten into it, involves a real kind of conversion. It, it involves our changing our attitude as designers toward the built world. It means that suddenly you realize uh, that you can't judge the built world according to your private subjective criteria. That you have to look at these at these artifacts, these buildings, these cities, as having an existence of their own. It's independent of what you think about them. And their viability springs from this fact. And if you really want to enter then the, the field of activity that involves conserving, stabilizing, retrieving, recycling, adapting these fabrics, the first thing you have to do is to suspend, no, that's not the right word, you have to develop parallel sets of standards. Uh, as a designer, naturally, you have to maintain your own internal concepts of what is good and bad design. But as someone who's working on a built fabric, you have to have a totally different uh, point of view. You have to have the point of view of a curator, of somebody into whose care an artifact has been entrusted. If you find that artifact so offensive, so ugly, so outrageously unattractive that you can't handle it, then you should give up the commission. But this, I think, is one of the fundamental uh, conversions that contemporary architects have to go through if they're seriously interested in, uh, in entering this new field of activity. As I say, I think it's the, it's the only real prospect for American architects, for, uh, architects and urbanists in the Western world. I think that we have reached the absolute outer limits of uh, wasteful uh, use of land and resources. There's really no, there's hardly any uh, buildable land left in the states. 
can be exploited and abused in a way that we've done the past 25, 30 years. So that it seems to me that this is really the, the only real perspective that we have. At the same time, it seems to me that this is a very thrilling ex experience. I don't consider this a, a prospect of your being locked into some kind of situation in which you can never express your own creativity, your own imagination, your own uh, uh, taste and elegance of choice. On the contrary, I think as some of these slides that I'm going to show you now will indicate that uh, uh, very often architects perform much better if they're confronted with very real limits. Um, One of the great composers, Stravinsky, said, in art, when all things are possible, no things are possible. And I think he put his finger right on the essence of the problem. Creativity does not depend upon your, the creativity for the artist does not depend upon your having absolute freedom to do anything you goddamn well want to do. On the contrary, if you're boxed in by all kinds of circumstances, if you really have talent and ability, this is under these circumstances that this talent is most apt to flower. Delete that phrase, I forgot I was in Muncie. Uh, <coughs> we have a certain elite way of talking in the East. But in any case, the perspective that this field offers young designers is anything but limiting. On the contrary, I think if you decide to solve the problems that actually play upon you and your clients in experiential reality, that your options will be enormously broadened. They will not be narrowed. Then you really won't be confined to deciding whether this month you're going to copy Philip Johnson or perhaps try out the, uh, Ralph Knowles' latest device or maybe go to the New York Five or look in to see what... Uh, what, uh, uh, well, what any of the stylish designers are doing. I think you'll find that this, this new attitude opens up a whole range of possibilities, which otherwise you would never have discovered. In any case, that's my conviction. If we can have the lights out now, <coughs> uh, I thought you might be interested <coughs> in seeing some examples, disparate examples, about what's going on around the world and the retrieval and recycling of various artifacts of different sizes. Because, of course, what you see here is that the same technology which has been used to destroy the built world can also be applied to its reconstruction. In fact, some of the most uh, thrilling examples in this field come precisely from the great cities of Europe that were flattened in World War II. And this is where the highest level of practice uh, is to be found and where some of the most exciting examples are. So we can see uh, some, some instances of this now. Uh, London was a savagely mauled city in World War II. The whole uh, of the city proper around St. Paul, for example, was largely leveled. <clears throat> Through some miracle, St. Paul itself escaped. And uh, as a matter of fact, the British architects and town planners have restructured the city around St. Paul in such a fashion that not only is that whole uh, city a much richer experience to live in and move through, but the whole position of the cathedral itself has been enormously extended and stabilized. Here, for example, is a new view of the cathedral from the river up toward the cathedral, which was never before possible. Wren might have liked to have had it that way, but not until now has it been possible to approach the cathedral from this particular vantage point. If you climb to the top of the steps, you'll find a great plaza <coughs> along the uh, south facade of the side, of the south flank of the cathedral, which never existed before. This is a result of uh, demolition. I'm glad to report that this summer the buses will no longer occupy this space in the foreground, so that for the first time it'll be possible to walk around uh, in full air enjoy this aspect of the church in a way that was never feasible before. If you turn to the right and look toward the west end of the church, you'll see that a new complex has been created here, two 
steeples, little Iranian churches. Only the steeples survived the bombing. And uh, the one in the foreground has been incorporated into a new uh, building, or set of buildings, which houses the choir school of St. Paul, one of the famous schools in uh, <coughs> London. The architecture in the background leaves, I think, a lot to be desired. But in this context, the design of the individual buildings is actually secondary to the overall urbanistic experience. I think that's one thing one can learn from a lot of the British work. If you go to the front of the cathedral, the west front, which looks back toward the, <coughs> the city, uh, you'll see a new, whole new set of spaces has been created. Again, the buildings may not strike you as being distinguished, but the fact is the cathedral now has a kind of forecourt atrium which Wren always wanted for it, but which had never before been accomplished. And then uh, again, looking, moving the same direction, these steps lead up to a whole system, new sequence of plazas uh, with the cathedral here on your, off the screen on the right. If you turn and look, you'll see that uh, uh, I mean, this construction in the foreground is uh, underground a workshop for the cathedral, which it never had before, and that's now been completed, and the paving now runs, the monumental paving now extends around the entire church, and it has a platform, a base, uh, really uh, uh, equal to its fundamental nobility. And this has all been extracted uh, out of it as the consequences of war. And this is another view of another aspect of the cathedral never before possible and the result of the way in which the area around the church has been reconstructed. Uh, there are hundreds of passages of this sort uh, that demonstrate this general principle around the cathedral. Uh, another fascinating example of this in London is uh, the Barbican district. These are not very good photographs, I'm sorry to say, but this was the part of London that was most savagely bombed in World War II. Only a few, a handful of monuments, such as this little parish church, uh, remain. And the decision was made quite properly that <clears throat> though these fragments were not in themselves uh, especially notable artistically, they nevertheless <clears throat> were of great significance historically and sentimentally, and they would consequently be preserved, and new designs would be organized around them. They, would, they were to serve as sort of polarizing points, uh, the way you precipitate crystals in a solution by running a charged wire through it. And this is one of these passages where a whole system of blocks and high-rise offices has been built around this little parish church. And walking a little further along that elevated <coughs> passageway, the church here is off to the, uh, the screen to your right. You see a whole system of new waterways, pools, and canals. And these uh, are generated by the fact that uh, in clearing away the debris, they found <coughs> the <coughs> remo r remains of uh, the old Roman and the medieval fortifications of London. That's where the term Barbican comes from. So what you see here is, uh, is the, the moat of medieval London, which has been formalized and, and transposed into a, a whole system of pools and, and fountains and canals, which, it, which laces through the whole uh, complex. Uh, on that platform, you see uh, some late Roman sarcophagi among other things, graveyards in this area were so destroyed there was no possibility of restoring them. So some of these funerary monuments have been organized like this uh, as sort of sculptural interludes in the landscape. Uh, another view of this platform, new platform on which the parish church has been placed. The church itself has been restored. Here you got a very nice little British domestic touch, uh, the parson of the church has been given a duplex in that new building, and that little sunken garden is his private garden and connects 
underground with the restored uh, church. <clears throat> and another view looking back toward that first uh, shot, the Barbican, the canal, the uh, restored Roman wall is off screen to the left. <clears throat> and uh, you see, I think you see here a kind of richness of variety and, and uh, uh, stimulation, which would be very difficult, if not impossible, to invent. One sees the same, as I said, the same sort of thing going on. For example, in Paris, Paris had very little damage <coughs> from World War II, scarcely any damage. What you're looking at here is a result of highway engineers and not the military aviators. Uh, the French have selected the Marais, which is one of the old districts of Paris, as a kind of demonstration area in which the federal government, the municipality, and the <coughs> private individuals are cooperating in a program uh, which they hope will not only preserve this uh, wonderful part of Paris, but also preserve the populations, the lifestyle that inhabits it. It's a very mixed uh, uh, district, uh, been for centuries famous for its uh, craftsmanship, its jewelers, and lace makers, and, and couturiers, as well as for aristocratic houses and the whole plan is to, uh, to renovate this area while preserving this mix. Uh, what you're looking at here is <clears throat> these buildings were all demolished to make way for a traffic interchange which fortunately has since been cancelled and uh, when I was there a couple of years ago work had started on the regeneration of this plaza. Not exactly its reconstruction but its uh, rehabilitation uh, this is a view <coughs> of the same situation where uh, one of these great hotels has been completely restored and uh, next to it you see buildings of the same genre which uh, are scheduled for similar restoration. A little further down, I'm sorry, that one. A little further down you see other buildings in which this process has already been completed. So within, say, five years this uh, <clears throat> fragment of old Paris will have been completely uh, regenerated. The pathology, uh, pathological aspects will have been removed and new tissue will have been uh, created. And the whole Marais is full of examples of this. In some cases, uh, they've inserted new buildings where they've made an attempt uh, not to mimic the old, but to sort of echo it. I don't think it's terribly successful, but this is a very difficult problem which very few architects have had any real experience in. In any case, this is a new library that's been inserted in one of the vacant areas. In another part of the quarter, there are big blocks uh, surrounded by those six-story walk-ups that we've all seen in 19th century operas kind of garage that La Boheme languished and died in. And uh, <clears throat> many of these blocks are now being uh, rehabilitated uh, with elevators, modern heating, plumbing, and so forth at rents, uh, working class rents. But then in the center of this particular block, they've built these uh, masonettes for sale. Again, one doesn't have to like the architecture necessarily, but <clears throat> it's an effort to, to guarantee that in the future, as in the past, this district will have a mix of different classes. And on the extreme right, uh, an old uh, hotel or palais, which has been completely restored and has been leased to a big international company as its headquarters. <clears throat> So that all through this district, one sees this kind of mix of, of, of restoration, preservation, new, new tissue being inserted in an effort to keep the kind of life uh, for which that district was famous. Uh, back in London, <clears throat> another very interesting uh, historical historic district, uh, the St. Catherine the area of St. Catherine's Docks, which is on the Thames, 
just below the Tower of London. The Tower of London is just off the screen, the left, this picture. <clears throat> These are, this is a complex of industrial buildings of very considerable aesthetic merit and great technical uh, interest, standpoint of history of technology. They were initially all scheduled to be demolished. This, these uh, basins were to be filled in. The perfectly conventional housing was going to be built there. But the plans were changed. The whole area is now being rehabilitated. The warehouses converted into office space. The <coughs> head of the, uh, the dock, the offices for the dock captain, has been made into the shops and apartments. And the whole water. Uh, will now be used as a marina for pleasure craft. So that this uh, area now faces a totally new uh, use, uh, which uh, is a direct result of the decision having been made to keep the old fabric and find these new uses. Uh, another shot, uh, looking back toward the Tower of London, a new hotel has been built right on the river. <clears throat> the fencing in the foreground is all temporary. The cast iron columns are the remains of one of the warehouses that was uh, destroyed in World War II. But when this project is finished, it'll be a mix of old and new <clears throat> that I think will be infinitely more interesting, rewarding than it would have been had it all been bulldozed and uh, built up from the ground. Another typical streetscape in London where nothing remained, literally nothing remained in this whole area except the tower of the church. All the fabric around it is new and uh, organized around this, the space reorganized around this church. Another example from another part of the city. And obviously one of the reasons that uh, <coughs> this is an attractive area to not only to Londoners but to tourists is precisely because it has a kind of complexity and intricacy that can't possibly be invented. No matter what your budget is or your talent, you can't uh, uh, recreate, you can't replicate historical process. And uh, it's understanding of this factor, I think, that makes much of the work in London as in many other cities, so interesting today. This is uh, the Guild Hall in the right background, also very badly bombed. This is a new plaza uh, uh, recently created, and this new reinforced concrete marquee connects the Guild Hall to new offices out of sight on the left. We've done considerable <coughs> Uh, renovation of urban tissue in some American cities, uh, none of it as a result of war, though sometimes if you look at American cities, it looks very much as though there has been extended aerial bombardment. <clears throat> One of our earliest examples is in Philadelphia, where 25 years ago, <clears throat> the decision was made to not merely to restore <clears throat> Independence Hall, but to uh, put it in a completely new urban context, I think everybody today realizes that though this was a well-intentioned uh, uh, motive that was a disastrously uh, misdirected, it resulted in the demolition, as you can see here, of a whole section of uh, downtown Philadelphia, including many 18th and many very important 19th century structures. <coughs> and its replacement by this great uh, Baroque axis, uh, which was dropped in the, this context without much attention to the consequences. Another view of the same uh, area. This is something, unfortunately, I don't think could happen today. I think we've learned an important lesson. I don't think this will ever happen again in the States, but <clears throat> it has happened there. So now we have the, we see the, the, this little Baroque uh, <coughs> provincial building in a kind of uh, monumental splendor. It was never designed to endure. The, obviously, the <coughs> high-rise 
buildings around it are regrettable, but they're a matter of historic fact. I mean, they were there, you have to accept them. Uh, but the most serious consequence has been that uh, buildings on a very mechanical basis, it was decided that, for example, the second bank, the white marble Strickland bank in the middle, <clears throat> was to be preserved because it conformed to some kind of abstract standard of validity. The library here in the uh, foreground was to be preserved, but other buildings around it, because they were later uh, Victorian structures, were demolished. <clears throat> and uh, further down, you get the same thing around the Carpenter's Hall, a, a little uh, elegant little dollhouse of a structure that actually occupied the end of a 12-foot cobbled alley. It was never designed to be exposed nakedly like this. All the buildings around it were taken down, and it stands now in the middle of a uh, landscaped uh, desert. It was so embarrassing that now we're building reproductions of some of the buildings that were demolished along both sides. So it, it has, again, the kind of urban support it had before. <clears throat> Here's another view of this bank building seen in a way that it was never supposed to have been seen. Only the front and back are really marble, and the sides are second-class stone. And it's, in other words, it's been, uh, <clears throat> this intervention has been, hasn't consolidated or strengthened the monument, but rather weakened it. As an individual building, it's been very skillfully adapted for use as a museum, as you'll see if you go to Philadelphia this year. Another consequence of this same <clears throat> misapplied uh, technical capacity, uh, a stretch you see where a few 18th century houses have been preserved, probably because they had historical associations, whereas others that were just every bit as good had been demolished, and the result is you get a kind of texture that never uh, existed anywhere, and the Parks Department has tried to fill some of these vacuums by improvising gardens. It's very difficult to see how we'll undo, <clears throat> completely undo damage of this sort. But further down, to, to, closer to the river in Philadelphia, there's been another <clears throat> experiment, much more successful. <clears throat> and that's the rehabilitation of the Society Hill section, which, as I'm sure you all know, was characterized by a gridiron pattern of of uh, three-story townhouses, very typical, one, really just one basic module, three bays wide, three stories high. <clears throat> and there are many, many blocks with this character. 25 years ago, they were in fairly shabby condition. Uh, they were what we would have then called slums. I don't think we would have called them slums today, but in any case, the decision was made, this entire district was designated a historic district, and a long, broad-scale plan for its renovation <clears throat> was put into effect. In addition to streetscapes like that, there were a number of quite important monuments, like Christ Church, and the plan was to rehabilitate the area, <clears throat> to create a new system of little parklets, walkways, pedestrian passages so that the area would <clears throat> yield another kind of pleasure both to the owners and to visitors. And I think that's been very largely accomplished. <clears throat> you have, for example, a whole sequence of passages of this sort that have resulted from this master planning. The regeneration of Society Hill has been spectacular in terms of uh, the tax roll, uh, the whole area has unquestionably been brought back to a much higher level of <clears throat> uh, economic productivity than, than before. <clears throat> For the start, uh, there was a very wise policy that <clears throat> new infill uh, could be, should be, frankly, new. It would observe uh, <clears throat> certain norms of color height, texture, but that the individual architecture could, uh, within those limits, could 
express the creativity of the architect. And there are a lot of new buildings, as in the center here, which are, some of them are successful, some of them less so. But in any case, it's one of our first American attempts to show that, that the old and the new can coexist uh, if we work at it hard enough. Uh, <clears throat> some of the cases, I think, are very un unhappy. This is one block. Uh, these are row houses, believe it or not. They look like a Mussolini tomb, but uh, <clears throat> behind these portentous facades are really the same plans, exactly the same plans as uh, this, these houses across the street. And uh, I think here the lack of uh, sensitivity is very clear. This is a typical kind of architectural era. The street's been blasted wide open by a designer who has his own vested interest and is determined to imprint upon this community his own idea of the way things ought to be. But uh, I think that we can say that, well, we have to make exceptions like this, of course. These are two houses by, <clears throat> shall we say, a couple of idiosyncratic architects, or at least men with idiosyncratic clients. But by and large, I think the effort has been uh, very successful. Among other things, of course, the decision was made to put uh, a cluster of high-rise towers in the center of the area. That's been subject to some discussion. But in any case, this part of Philadelphia has now been <clears throat> regenerated. The, a lot of the old buildings are much more secure, much more stable than they have, were in the past. And a great many more people are enjoying the experience. Uh, we can find interventions of varying sorts all over the world. This is a very interesting <coughs> project for a new luxury hotel in Prague, uh, right adjacent to the tin church, the old cathedral, where <coughs> an entire district, this is a plan, uh, this entire area <coughs> will be uh, internally reorganized as a luxury hotel, a tourist hotel, with all the <clears throat> major architectural features, both external and internal, uh, incorporated into the new design. I think that an establishment like this is going to be a great deal more successful than the new Sheridan International, which has been also been built in Prague, right down the street. <coughs> But in any case, we begin to see that <clears throat> old buildings are not merely obstacles, are not obstacles to pro progress at all, but actually, if properly understood, become uh, very important new potentials. Something of the same sort has been done in Washington around Lafayette Square. Uh, the White House <clears throat> in this photograph is just off to the left, to the right of the photograph. And uh, this square and its partner across, uh, this block and its partner across the square were slated 10 years ago for demolition. All these buildings were to be demolished. And two great big white uh, office blocks, government office blocks, were to be erected <coughs> in their place. Uh, fortunately, the lunacy of this proposal was recognized by President Kennedy, and he canceled that and had another one started in which the two big buildings, which you see here in red brick in the background, <clears throat> would be inserted, so to say, in the middle of the block. And the old uh, 19th century uh, fabric would be kept as a sort of screen so that the scale, the urban scale of this part would remain <clears throat> more or less congruent with the White House. That's been done, and in real life, I think it's quite successful. Here you see the Corcoran Museum, which has been completely restored, the <clears throat> guest house of the federal government. <clears throat> and then both sides of the, uh, of the square, the, of these old houses have been rehabilitated, re internally reorganized. And in real life, as one walks around the square, one is hardly aware of these big <clears throat> 
massive office blocks in the background. <clears throat> the same thing is true on the other side of the square. <clears throat> and uh, the consequence is undoubtedly that the White House, uh, the position of the White House in this part of the urban landscape has been strengthened rather than weakened by this uh, type of intervention. Behind, on both sides of the square, behind the old <clears throat> restored buildings, between the old buildings and the new blocks are courtyards of this general sort. Again, whatever reservations <clears throat> that you or I might have about the de architectural details, the fact is that this is an incomparably more richer urban experience than would have been the case if those two gargantuan blocks had been dropped there. Some very interesting things going on <clears throat> in this area in Boston. <clears throat> uh, this is a uh, scheme by I am Pay for the Christian Science Mother Church <clears throat> in Boston. That's the building on the right-hand side, a rather cold and graceless kind of uh, Beaux-Arts construction, <clears throat> which of course for the church has great significance. That's the publishing house of the Christian Science Church in the background. And Pay's task was to reorganize the whole <clears throat> area around these buildings in such a fashion that they formed a more congruent whole, and uh, also to create a new monumental entrance to the church itself. Paving, landscaping, it's all been handled with great care, meticulous care. And then you realize that a new axis has been created down the flank of the church, a new office building for the church on the right, and uh, a colonnade in the middle distance with a reflecting pool. <clears throat> it's pretty monumental, it's also pretty cold, but it has the same kind of uh, meticulous craftsmanship that the church original church dictates. You can barely see in the background another building which we'll get to later, that's the Hancock Tower. In this particular photograph, it's invisible, the way the architects promised it would always be. But uh, in any case, uh, <clears throat> I think that here we can see American architects beginning to respond to this new kind of obligation. We have a long ways to go, but these are encouraging uh, signs. Then, of course, we can intervene to save just individual buildings. Uh, this is King's Cross Station in London, one of the great railroad stations, 19th century stations of London, which for a century was surrounded with a, a whole growth of urban clutter in recent uh, last year or two that's all been put underground and uh, reorganized so that in the church and the building itself uh, restored so that one uh, gets a much more uh, pleasant secure sense of the station being returned to its original context Back in Philadelphia, <clears throat> we have another case, a typical case in modern life where <clears throat> buildings of recognized value cannot be saved uh, uh, for one reason or another. They have to be uh, transported or moved or because of the original tenants have disappeared, we have to find new ways of preserving them or parts of them. And increasingly, you see uh, uh, that, for example, only the facade of a building can be saved. This is a, a little white marble building in the middle of this picture is uh, in Philadelphia. In fact, it's on the square <coughs> across the street from Independence Hall. <coughs> it uh, was built in the 1840s and for a century has been the home office uh, of a big insurance company. <coughs> 
They own the entire block and had planned to expand. And for sentimental reasons, they had decided to try to preserve this little building in some way, some fashion. And Jurgela, Mitchell Jurgela, the architects, uh, came up with a proposition <coughs> that uh, the facade alone, uh, not the building behind it, which had no real significance, but that the facade could be conserved as a part of the new proposal. And this is what was agreed upon. The On the, on the right-hand side <coughs> is the old office building. In the middle is the new office building. And on the left-hand lower corner is the little reconstituted white marble uh, building. In real life, this is not as comical as it seems in this uh, photograph, because uh, at the pedestrian scale, as you walk along, uh, as in the case of Lafayette Square, this uh, little building does in fact screen to a very large extent this great glass tower behind it. Uh, this juxtaposition of a minute 19th century and grossly overscaled 20th century buildings, of course, is typically American. You find this everywhere. It's without precedent. There's no, no precedent for handling it. And I'm not sure but what uh, Mitchell Jurgler don't deserve a lot of credit for having tackled it head on. Here you see the <coughs> building being, the facade being uh, disassembled blocks were all marked and stored, and then when the building was finished, they'd been re-erected. <coughs> this is the architect's sketch, and this is a, his sketch of how that screen wall would function in relation to the uh, Independence Hall on the left-hand side and the new tower on the right. When you get to Philadelphia this summer, you can judge for yourself how successful you think this project is. But whether you think it's successful or not, I think you ought to recognize that we're going to be confronted more and more with this type of problem in American cities. <clears throat> uh, in Boston, again, there's another example of this, uh, quite unfortunate, I think. Uh, uh, this is a second uh, congregational church late Gothic revival structure which was gutted by fire about 10 years ago and only the steeple <coughs> and the gable end remained. Paul Rudolph was given the commission for designing a new church uh, with the stipulation that the old facade would be preserved a la Coventry in England and uh, here I think the architect failed uh, quite dismally and I think he failed because uh, he uh, <coughs> juxtaposed to this old fragment, a very powerful, uh, rather eccentric creation of his own, which uh, if it were by itself would probably be a quite acceptable creation, but I think in juxtaposition to the old uh, fragment, it's uh, really quite uh, unsuccessful. In other words, instead of strengthening the position <coughs> of the old building or the old fragment in the cityscape, I think that he's actually weakened. And again, it's because I'm afraid because of the very virtuosity of the architect himself, his inability to subordinate his ambitions to the <coughs> requirements of the, of the old building. There's a couple of very interesting things going on in Canada. In uh, Winnipeg, I unfortunately don't have a slide, uh, the, the Catholic Cathedral in Winnipeg was gutted by fire several years ago. And after a lot of discussion whether to wreck the building, put up a completely new structure, reconstruct the old structure, the decision was made <coughs> to stabilize the entire cruciform uh, plant and uh, very much like the Coventry solution in England, and then build a new uh, church in the crossing, which was done. Uh, in uh, Montreal, <clears throat> after a great deal of controversy, this 19th century Gothic revival church uh, was demolished, but such a clamor was raised about its role in the cityscape that uh, the decision was made to keep these two towers 
which have always played an important part in the area around in Montreal, and they'll be incorporated in a new structure. How gracefully this will be done remains to be seen. But in any case, you can see all over the world an increasing number of instances of this sort, which indicate that uh, we've got to work out some quite new solutions. <clears throat> it's amazing what has to be done often to save buildings, old buildings. Uh, as I said, one typical way to save them is to find uh, new tenants. The very fact that they're endangered is uh, <clears throat> proof of the fact that the old tenants disappeared. Often that won't work. You have to move the building to a new site. But here in Springfield, Illinois, something else happened. Uh, this is a view of the old uh, capital, Springfield, <clears throat> which, as you probably know, occupied a Square in the center of the city, and about 10 years ago, the urban <coughs> renewal people decided that progress uh, dictated that this building should go and the parking garage should be put under the plaza. This was an ineluctable <coughs> course of progress. This created a tremendous uh, backlash in uh, Springfield because it happens that in this building in April of 1865, the only state funeral for Abraham Lincoln had been held. And obviously there were people in Springfield who had known this all along. But it wasn't until the building was threatened with demolition that these people uh, organized and uh, determined to, not merely to prevent the disappearance of this building, but to to demand that it be reconstituted <clears throat> in the form it had when Lincoln's body lay there in state. And they were successful in their demands. So the decision was made to disassemble the building, dismantle it, uh, excavate the three-story underground garage, and then reconstitute the building <clears throat> in its original fashion, and this is exactly what was done. Here you see the building when the disassembly has just started. The copper has been stripped from the dome. Uh, it's worth noting that in the 1880s, this building had been elevated, been jacked up an additional floor, so that the first floor was not to be, uh, was to be removed as, when the building was rebuilt. <clears throat> And a whole series of quite wonderful photographs was taken by the architects, who incidentally were not, had never done anything of this sort before. This was their first <coughs> job, and they're really a remarkable piece of <coughs> uh, work involved. Because there was no visual evidence <coughs> as to what the inside of the building uh, looked like, there was one newspaper engraving uh, of showing the catafalque in which Lincoln's body lay in the Senate House, but otherwise there was no data. And so the architects had a detective job in taking the building apart to try to reconstruct its, uh, the morphological changes that it had undergone. undergone. <clears throat> and they were successful. They did that. All, everything was analyzed very carefully. All kinds of new evidence was uncovered in the process of demolition. And here the here the first part of the project is completed. The old building is gone. The hole in the ground has been dug, and now the process is reversed. <clears throat> a concrete armature was built to accept the uh, cut stone facing. The first three floors under the chapel, under the capitol, are, have now become the archives of the Illinois State Historical Commission. And, uh, <clears throat> The stone was all rehung on the skeleton, the landscaping of the plaza complete, and the building now stands as it stood on that day in April 1865. The interiors have been completely uh, reconstructed. This is the Senate House, the way it looked when 
funeral took place, <clears throat> and all the monumental portions of the building have been uh, beautifully restored. And uh, this is the garage that started the whole business. It's now functioning too. It's out of focus because when I photographed it, I was angry. <clears throat> but in any case, it shows that uh, <clears throat> it shows that uh, even irreconcilable demands like this can be reconciled, provided that you've got people who are really determined, who have real issues at stake and are determined to defend them. <clears throat> and I think all of Springfield is richer for this, not only because they preserved the, uh, and restored that one monument, but because, but because a great many people in Springfield have learned a lot about their own history, which they never knew before. And of course, another way to serve old, or save old buildings is to make museums out of them. The country that leads the world in this regard is Italy. This is the uh, great municipal museum in Milano, housed in the Castello Sforzesca, <coughs> a great uh, medieval palace, a fortress palace, which had actually been the museum for the city before World War II. After World War II, it was completely reinstalled. Uh, these are a few photographs of the pre-war installation of the museum, and the photographs of the same galleries as they have been reinstalled with modern design, lighting techniques, ventilation, and so forth. <clears throat> this was a sculpture gallery before the war. And this is the way sculpture is handled in the museum today. Painting gallery before the war, and the same. Uh, I'm sorry, this is upside down, which is a pity. <clears throat> One of the great problems, of course, was uh, flexibility of installation. And uh, this is one of the galleries in which these screens, uh, which can be moved according to that modular grid, have been handled. Paintings uh, under this new context have a totally new, uh, I think, new significance because of this really quite adroit, quite skillful way in which the architects have taken this old vessel and not hesitated to, uh, in the actual installation, to employ the most modern uh, techno technologies and also uh, aesthetics. <coughs> uh, another great <coughs> An interesting example, an installation of a new museum in the old castle at Verona, <clears throat> where they had a complex of buildings of this sort. These are construction shots showing the restoration of the building. The Italians, of course, are past masters at this old technique. Of, uh, here you have, for example, one passage in which you have a new concrete Reinforced concrete fire escape has been very candidly installed in this old medieval structure. The galleries themselves are, I think, quite ravishing. The structure is all the original framing. The floors are new, terrazzo floors. The stairs, of course, are new. <coughs> this is one hall in which, in the process of restoration, these very important painted uh, stenciled and painted uh, walls were discovered, and they have been conserved and uh, become then part of the exhibit material itself. So here you have an old building which is itself a historic artifact being adapted uh, to house a display of other artifacts which are not necessarily related to it. And I think contemporary architects would be very hard put to it to invent interiors more, a sequence of interiors more flattering to the art and more stimulating to the passerby than what comes out of this kind of conversion. There's an interesting thing going on in Washington right now that seems to promise a good result. This is the I am Pays addition to the National Gallery. This is an early shot with the National Gallery in the foreground, the excavation for the new Pay Gallery. This is a photograph of the model uh, of the Pay edition with the old uh, 
Beaux-Arts classical Bible structure in the back way. <clears throat> this is an old building that was designed as a museum, Corcoran's private gallery, which you've already seen in that across the street from the White House. This is a building that had been closed for many years and been slated for demolition when this issue came up. And the decision was made not to demolish it, but to restore it architecturally and reinstall it as a museum. So now it's one of the uh, many museums. <coughs> There's something like 12 or 14 museums the Smithsonian now uh, operates in Washington. and. Uh, it is now a museum of the decorative arts with changing exhibits. And internally, all the architects have done is just to restore uh, the building to its original condition. Elsewhere in Washington, the old patent office, uh, a Greek revival structure from the 40s and 50s, has been uh, converted into a very handsome National Portrait Gallery. Very successful job. And here again, the intervention is really rather modest. The new floors, new lighting, new paint, but fundamentally, the building has, was found to be quite uh, suitable, very adaptable, without any major changes. The interesting thing is that a part of the building, which was rebuilt in the 1870s in cast iron and glass, uh, has also been restored and handled just as carefully as the earlier Greek Revival passages. I think this is a measure of our growing maturity because 10 years ago, uh, I think this, these parts of the museum would not have been preserved. Uh, everybody might have agreed that the Greek Revival was worth saving, but not this uh, high Victorian neglected. But I think now we understand that all of this is part of our inheritance, our patrimony, and uh, the fact that you might like uh, squat Doric columns better than these attenuated cast iron ones is not really relevant to the subject. In any case, I think this uh, whole complex is now an extremely interesting experience. I think that's the last. No, no. This is the, it's difficult to close any lecture on American architecture today without mentioning the Hancock Tower in Boston. Because if there ever was an example, a proof of the fact that we've reached the end of a period, I think the Hancock Tower in Boston will stand as such. I don't know how familiar you people are with the full dimensions of this fiasco. This is our first multi-story self-destruct <laughs> activity. This tower was forced on Boston over the opposition of everybody in Boston, the antiquarians, the blue-haired ladies, the historians, the bird watchers. Everybody in Boston was opposed to this building, excepting Hancock, his architect, seven out of 12 aldermen. So over this protest, this building was inserted into one of the oldest and most, not the oldest, but one of the most historically significant uh, structures, uh, parts of Boston. And it's very seldom that, uh, that you know, uh, <clears throat> one's arguments are vindicated as quickly and as absolutely as this Hancock Tower disaster. Uh, in order, this building, as I said, has generated a, a microclimate which is literally tearing it apart. Uh, there have been buildings on this block for 115 years, and hitherto they all managed to stand up. It wasn't until this building came along that a new kind of climate was created microclimate that's tearing it apart. And not only is it tearing it apart, but it's tearing all the buildings around it apart. Uh, the P Hancock has had to buy the Copley Plaza Hotel on the right. It was cheaper to buy it than to go through all the lawsuits. Uh, they haven't been able to buy the church because the church is not for sale, and so they're now locked in a lawsuit with the church. 
uh, there's a, a nightmare system of, of uh, lawsuits. Everybody's suing everybody. <clears throat> and now the latest discovery is, having replaced all the thermopane, which wouldn't stay in, this is a photograph <clears throat> when it was the tallest plywood structure in the world. <clears throat> you can't tell. At one stage, it was completely sheathed in plywood because all this glass blew out, popped out in a very eccentric fashion. It's now been all replaced with the 5 8 inch plate, and you can imagine what this does to the metabolic balance of the building and its environment. It must mean a, a quadruple air conditioning, summer cooling load, and probably a double or treble uh, heating load in the winter. But now that that's been completed, it's been it's discovered that uh, the wind bracing is all wrong. And somehow or other, they're going to have to insert the shear walls into this completely finished structure. And the gossip is that there are now serious calculations going on, which indicate that it'll be cheaper to disassemble the structure right now than to go any further with it. <laughs> Anyway, I can close on this pessimistic note because uh, I think it demonstrates the point I'm trying to make, and that is that in this particular trajectory of progress, we have really reached the ultimate limit, and we just it's not possible to go any further. So we're going to have to re-examine the whole, our whole situation, and, uh, and part of this re-examination must necessarily be a re-examination of the past because you can't possibly have any coherent plot, any coherent picture of the future with only two points. Any surveyor knows you have to have three points or two points to establish a third. So it's not enough to ridicule the Hancock Tower, which is merely a, a typical example of the limits of American technological arrogance. But to, to ask the question, how can we see to it that these disasters don't occur again? And uh, the first question we're going to have to ask is, is, where do these buildings come from phylogenetically? What's the origin of these conflicts? How is it possible that they could go so wrong, and how can we in the future prevent it? So that is really the substance of my sermon. I, I hope it doesn't sound too... Uh, <clears throat> dismal. I, as a matter of fact, I'm not uh, disappointed at all. I think this constitutes a very uh, attractive future for us. But it certainly involves some novel, some new attitudes and re-examinations of a lot of cherished cliches. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
and uh, if you want to take the occasion of July the 4th, 1976 to do it, that's as apposite as any. But uh, the kind of crisis that I describe, I think, is independent of the fact that uh, it happens to be 200 years since the signing of the Declaration. First of all, it's not a uniquely American dilemma. It's, it's a world dilemma. It just happens to be more acute in America because of our advanced, close quote, technological development. But it's not a uniquely American problem. The curriculum of every architectural school in the world reads just like the one here at Muncie. It's in a different language, sometimes in a different alphabet, but the substance of education is identical. And, the, and as a consequence, the uh, mistakes are identical. You can go to Timbuktu, uh, you know, which is a wonderful city. The city covers as much territory as uh, Paris. It's all one story high, except that there's a 24-story skyscraper in the center. And it's permanently deformed. It's so deformed by solar action that the elevators won't move in the sheds. And uh, these poor people, you know, a lot of a lot of the national wealth has been expended on this monument, this icon to progress, because they were told that to really join the modern world, it was essential that you have at least one glass wall skyscraper. Well, that mistake is really not a bit worse than what I and Pay has done. Boston is exactly the same kind of situation. We thank you very much again. I might just make one announcement, maybe to hear the other side of the coin. Tomorrow at 1 o'clock, the developer and the architect for Merchants Plaza in Indianapolis will be here to give a lecture on that inner city development so especially for the students and anyone else you're certainly welcome it'll be in this room here at one o'clock and uh professor fitch will be outside we'll have refreshments in the uh, exhibit area thank you all for coming thank you very much that was the end of professor Marston Fitch's lecture.